Poverty is not just the absence of money, but the absence of opportunity. And the United States is a country where you have both freedom and abundant opportunities. I'm moving to the United States as giving me both. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knit family. I was the third of four children. And the best thing that my parents gave me was the gift of education. Even though I came from a poor family, they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. But what my parents did was that they instilled in us the value of faith, hard work, and not giving up. They made us realize that if you put in the work, you will definitely get the reward. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. I got my first job at the age of 14. My job was on the construction site. My duties were to move concrete on a large pan from one end of the construction site to another one. I worked on that day from around six in the morning to about seven at night. At the end of the day, the employer refused to pay me. And our reason was because she did not authorize the foreman to hire me. So I worked from sunup to sundown and didn't get paid. That tore up my spirit. And from that moment on, I decided that I was going to become a lawyer. And I was going to use every ounce of strength within me to fight against injustice, regardless of how powerful the opponent is. I am a man that worked my way up from nothing. I know what it means to feel like you're being unfairly treated. And I'm the person that can stand up to opponents regardless of how big or how powerful they are. Welcome to this edition of Legal Angle with Emmanuel the Law Holowale. I have a guest today. His name is Don Roberts. He is a man who has worked as a police officer before he became a lawyer. He also worked at Waffle House. In fact, he has worked in different capacities before he became a lawyer. He's going to be sharing his story with us today from his legal journey and his career as a cop up to being a lawyer. Welcome to the show, Don. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you having me on your Legal Angle show. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? All right. Well, um, uh, seeing that your intro, it actually resembles a lot of my life. Uh, although I, I'm not from Nigeria, I actually I grew up for the most part in uh, northern Kentucky and Cincinnati area. Um, I was not necessarily uh, raised in a in a uh, influential or uh, um, more. I guess uh, I guess I would be counted as a middle income or lower middle income family. My, my mother worked as a factory worker, um, and uh, you know, I went to the public high school, uh, fairly urban neighborhood for the most part, most of my life. And um, uh, I went into the Air Force right after graduating high school, and I did that for four years. After that, I came out. Uh, I had decided that I was going to um, become a, a police officer and took the test. But in the meantime, you have to wait for your number to come up. So I looked around and I, I decided that uh, I wanted to work with Waffle House and, and be a manager there, uh, which was probably one of the most colorful and interesting jobs I've ever had. Uh, it probably equates right up there with the, the same excitement and interest factor that, that being a police officer was as far as a young, young guy getting out of the military looking for something to do. Wow, oh, that was interesting. So what was it like for you growing up in Kentucky? What was your family life like? Well, my, my primary life was we lived in, in uh, you know, fairly low-income housing for the most part. We lived in Covington, Kentucky. It was like 15th Street in Madison, very urban neighborhood. Uh, you know, um, I kind of saw 
being sort of growing up in the late seventies, early eighties, you know, you kind of saw the, the changing of the guard living in an urban neighborhood where, uh, the sort of the, the, uh, issues of racism were kind of right there in your face. You know, uh, I'd see, I'd be sitting on my, my front steps and there'd be a, a black guy and a white girl walking up the street. And then 15 minutes later, the same black guy is running down the street with a, several white kids chasing him. Um, you know, so, I mean, I saw that I had, I had friends of mine that were, there were black kids. Uh, some of my best friends were black kids. And I, I saw, racism from what they had experienced. But I also, you know, I was at their house sometimes and their dad would come home from work and they'd say, what's that white boy doing in my house? You know? <laughs> and I didn't really get that, that early on, you know, we were pretty young, probably 10, 12 years old at that point, riding big wheels out in the, out in the driveways and on the side of the alley there. But, uh, uh, so, I mean, I, it was interesting growing up that way. Um, and then moving on into high school, where it was a, there was a combination of the of the suburbs and the the urban the urban students sort of coming together and you kind of saw where that went um so that was my early years really i thought taught me a lot which moved right into transitioning into seeing much broader spectrums of different people when i went into the air force basic training i had you know, uh, some guys from from the southern states, a uh, guy from Alabama was one of our team leaders, and uh, uh, he was a completely different character. He was he was actually he was a he was a police officer, uh, a black police officer in one of the, the more impoverished um, Alabama cities, as he described it, um, which. I, I really learned a lot from that guy. And then we had another guy that was I was in basic training with. Uh, he was from California, very much the surfer dude kind of thing that you, you stereotype people from California sometimes. So it was really an, an interesting sort of situation, a learning experience as far as as learning people and, and the dynamics of where they come from and how they think and, and behave a lot. So but uh you know, moving forward out of from high school from Covington, Kentucky, where my wrestling coach was a police officer in high school, um, to moving into the Air Force, and you learn to have to work with people in spite of the differences that you might have. Whereas in high school, you kind of do the high school thing, you kind of group together in, in like minded groups. Um, so that was really a great experience, which and then when I got out, out of the Air Force after doing four years, I spent some time in Egypt, uh, another culture shock that was sort of trial by fire and, and learning how to, to, to deal with people from, from completely different uh, uh, parts of the world. Uh, you know, I went from Covington and my, my town in Kentucky and, and the differences in people there to the Air Force where we're all Americans, but we're, you know, learning to sort of uh, work together in closed contact, um, and then going to Egypt, where I'm actually dealing with people from another country. So it's it's always been a, an enjoyable challenge for me to work with different people. I mean, it led me right into working at Legal Aid, um, where a lot of my work was with the Somali community, another challenge of working with people that I've not really had the experience to, to really understand. Wow. So when you went into the Air Force, was it something you planned on doing out of high school or was it just a recruit that came in and all of a sudden you find yourself in boot camp? No, I uh, actually that's I have so many interesting stories. <laughs> uh, actually, I um, I was sort of that ABC after school special for anybody that's listening that that's about my age or maybe even a little bit older. But, uh, you know, those moral after school specials that were on TV, I was the uh, pregnancy in high school situation. Um, you know, in Kentucky, there's two things you can live by. You, you don't have to wear shoes all the time and you can start early as far as raising families. <laughs> so I was 17 years old when um, when my my daughter was born. And uh, I changed my plans from being someone that had no inclination of going into the military. My, my goal at that point in time in my senior year of high school before um, the, my daughter came along was that I was going to buy the cheapest van I could and work as I could 
needed gas till I made it to California and then sort of spend a year or two figuring out what I was going to do next on the beach. So, <laughs> but things change and uh, you, you learn from those experiences. And I thought, well, the only way I can sort of figure this out is go into the military and, and, you know, actually um, another unique issue was that they would pay me extra money because I would be married and have a child. So you actually got an increase in pay. <laughs> so it was a win-win situation as far as I was concerned. I can only imagine. <laughs> okay. So uh, going into the military, spending, uh, I believe four years there and you came back home and you, went back to work at the Waffle House? Well, um, again, so, such an enjoyable situation. It was a challenge because uh, although I worked at three of the different Waffle Houses and, and helped manage some of these, and, and two in Northern Kentucky and one in Cincinnati, my primary one was in Covington downtown, which there's sort of a bar district and, uh, uh, you know, the gentleman clubs, uh, to put it gently. Uh, so, uh, one of the time things that a waffle house manager has to do is they have to cover any shift of any job that's that, you know, people call in for, it's a very small crew and the job of a manager. And matter of fact, the training for a manager is you have to work in every single job that, that happens there before you can actually graduate, um, from waffle university is what it's called. <laughs> but, um, I really had a great time with it. I, I work bar rush, you know, the, the night shift a lot because that's a lot of times when people call in. So uh, I, I really bonded so well with, with my coworkers, with my waitresses, with my grill managers. Um, I learned a lot from them and it was such a interesting crowd, you know, people that are so a lot of times intoxicated, you know, uh, if you've ever been into a waffle house, it's a very unique place. And, uh, it's, you know, from the welcoming to, to actually the way you cook, it's a very specific skill, a pool system and everything. They talk a whole different language in there. Uh, but so many of the different things and challenges that you had, um, actually, as a police officer, showed up right there in my store, you know, night after night. So, uh, but you really, one of the things you really had to do that, that reminded me of the Air Force was, it's such a small little tiny restaurant that everybody's sort of right there on top of each other. So you really have to learn to work together with people and you have to work with, together with people with different goals, different ideas, different backgrounds. And, uh, you know, every night or every day that I would be in there, you know, those six people that we're together and, you know, for the most part within a foot or two apart from each other, uh, you know, you have to learn to, to, not just be a boss. Okay. It, being a manager, you know, you think, Oh, well, he was in charge. He was the boss, but not in waffle house. If you ever go into waffle house, you'll, you probably wouldn't be able to figure out which one is the manager because everyone is sort of in charge and everyone is pulling their own weight. And, uh, it was, it was a very enjoyable experience. It's like being in the trenches. And then after graduating from the university of waffle house, <laughs> you went into the police academy. What prompted did. you to do that? Well, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, my wrestling coach was a was a police officer in high school, and I bonded pretty well with him as far as you know, learning everything from wrestling to sort of teaching a young man how to behave, you know, and calling you out when you weren't when you stepped out of line. Um, so I had a lot of respect for, for Dave, uh, and, and when I got out of the air force and as I was actually home on leave a couple of times, I met up with him and he said, you know, you really ought to think about this. It would be a good, good place for you to, to, to go back to school and make some money or go back to, to, uh, to go to school. Because when I got out of the air force, I didn't really save as much money as I thought I was going to do. Like a lot of people go into the air force or the, any branch of the military to sort of help pay for school or help supplement their school because the uh, the ratio of how much you contribute and then the military will will contribute their share. The police department was actually very, very similar to that. So I, I realized that I, I wanted to go back to school. I didn't know if I wanted to be a paralegal or if I, or if I wanted to go all the way to be an attorney. 
I just, I did know though, after being a police officer for a while, that, that, that was definitely where I wanted to go. Um, you know, I, I, as a kid, I was always sort of the argumentative one. I was in a family of four, often my uncle who is closer to my brother, as far as my age, um, he lived with us most of the time. So, <clears throat> you know, there's, the, there's usually in a family, there's the peacemaker, there's the antagonist. Um, I was sort of that negotiator in the middle, you know, uh, if, if there was an argument to be made, it didn't matter what side it was. I was usually the one helping, you know, someone, if I had an argument to, to, to take for them. Um, and you know, it always was like, he's the lawyer in the family. And, um, I think that kind of stuck with me. So when I did that, it, um, as a police officer, I thought, well, yeah, that maybe that's where I need to go because if the idea of being a lawyer is really that great and and keeps haunting me, so to speak, uh, before I I get into that much education and that many years and and that kind of money, I thought, well, I'm going to find out if that's really what I want. Maybe just being a police officer is what I'm really wanting to do. And uh, so that I did that. I uh, graduated from the academy. Um, so again, trial by fire. Uh, you know first week or two out of the academy and I had a, a pretty grisly murder that I was, you know, one of the things that I was handling on the scene and watched a man die and right there in front of me as he, you know, took his last breath. Baptism of fire again. And how long did you spend as a police officer? I was a police officer for about three years. I, when I left the department, I was ready to go back, go to school. Um, can't really go to school. Uh, full time with a full time with being a police officer. There's a lot of shift work, but I did leave the police department um, knowing that domestic violence was really an issue. That that if I was going to pursue a law degree, that I thought I wanted to do something connected with domestic violence. And you know, coming from a police department, the natural inclination was to be a prosecutor. So I kind of thought maybe that's that's what I'm leaning towards. Um, I. During the three years I was a police officer, uh, again, I was a police officer in my hometown. And in the hometown that you grew up and went to school with, a lot of times the people that you're chasing are your, your friends from high school. And that was uh, definitely gave me an opportunity to sort of learn the, the, the tension of, of how you handle, you know, enforcing laws and applying it equally. Um, regardless of, of whatever your thoughts are as far as friendship or whatever prejudices people might have, you know, you have to be able to look past that and enforce laws. And um, an interesting thing actually was while I was a police officer, the Rodney King situation had occurred in California and that beating occurred and was on TV. And it's a lot like what we have experienced last summer with, with these, with, uh, you know, with what happened there and the result uh, after after that after the George Floyd situation, um, policing went through a big change after Rodney King. You know, when I first started in the police department, I worked third shift starting out, and third shift was a lot of times where it's known as you know you're kind of you're you're chasing bad guys and and they're you know you're fighting with people a lot and things like that where things get physical quite often. And, you know, it, it was a different world then. It was sort of what I call old school. You know, when I was a teenager in Covington, you know, we would, my friends and I would be out on the streets walking around midnight or something like that. And we'd be pulled over by a police officer. And, you know, as teenagers, we're not always the most polite, you know, a little bit mouthy. And next thing you know, your hands are on the hood, your pockets are emptied out on the hood and you mouth off and you get whacked in the hand with a, a nightstick. And my, I had plenty of bruised knuckles in those days. So that was kind of the situation that I was dealing with as a police officer when I first got out of the academy. I was learning the old school ways. And then Rodney King happened. OK. And after that, policing really changed. Okay. It wasn't as what you, what you would expect back in those days, you know, in the late eighties of, uh, you know, if you were a police officer, you were part of that network and they took care of you. Okay. Um, after the Rodney King administrations didn't cover for officers, there was a lot of prosecutions that happened 
shortly thereafter, very similar to the George Floyd situation and these cases where police officers are being sued again, okay? It's, it's basically sort of a cleansing of the police departments. Um, you know, I'm definitely pro-police. I believe police have a hard job, um, but I know just like lawyers, just like plumbers, just like auto mechanics, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And I agree, um, you know, I know I listened not too long ago with uh, Governor DeWine had talked about policing and how it was changing and that he was excited about the new trainings that they were doing. Uh, you know, one of the best things about police academy for me was it was very formal training. And that, that um, Airman Grissom actually was his name back in, back in the basic training, he talked about being on the police a lot. He talked about his training. His training was literally being hired and put in a car and he drove around for a week or two with someone. And they, then they taught him he got his own car. And uh, that was, that was the length of his training. The police Academy, when I went was at Eastern Kentucky university, we went down there, we had very detailed training, everything from use of force to, to driving, um, you know, everything that you could imagine. So it was really a, a very good training. So I learned a lot from that. And so being a police officer, it, seeing that stuff, seeing domestic violence, seeing that there's only so much police officers can do uh, in a domestic violence situation led me to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to at least go to paralegal school to, to see if that's the direction I want to go and, and help prosecute domestic violence cases. Thank you. So after you left the force, you decided to go to college to study for, for paralegal status? Yeah, I actually I went to um, University of Cincinnati. Um, I uh, basically moved across the river with my grandfather, stayed with him uh, while I tried to keep uh, as much money in my pocket as I could. So I went to school there. I worked immediately um, in part time job positions. So um, actually, I worked at DHL at the airport in Greater Cincinnati Airport and uh, loaded airplanes in the middle of the night till about six o'clock in the morning drove back to the parking garage on campus and slept for a couple hours until my class started with a little egg timer that sat on my dashboard. And, uh, and then, so I went to school, I started out getting uh, my associate degree in paralegal studies at university of Cincinnati. Again, not completely sure that I wanted to go to the extent of getting a law degree. And uh, I, I thought, well, if, if I can handle the paperwork of being a paralegal, then maybe I would want to continue on. And I did that. I worked, I did some uh, nighttime discovery work at, at a discovery factory, so to speak, where I did paralegal work in the middle of the night for Arthur Anderson in a couple of their big cases. So I did that. I worked at the public defender's office, interviewing people at the jail at night that got arrested and prepared them for their, their public defender. Um, and uh, again, I learned so much each time. And I, I realized that, um, you know, I realized the pros and cons of the public defender and I love public defender work. I love that the people that work for the public defender's office is they believe in what they're doing. But I also know I saw from my own, with my own eyes, with my experience, how inmates that are in jail, you know, they would sometimes throw things at me when I said, I'm with the public defender's office, you know, I'm here to try and hook you up with a lawyer. And, uh, you know, they'd say, oh, I don't want one of those public destroyers, you know. <laughs> they always had funny names for, for public defenders, but uh, it was never appreciative. Uh, so I would interview these guys. And uh, eventually I saw how many cases and how a lot of the public defenders had to handle those cases. And the volume is just impossible to really give everybody their fair shake in court sometimes. So I've, I felt that I wanted to pursue law and become an attorney and, and sort of help those forces. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I realized I didn't know if I wanted to work for a public defender's office as an attorney because some cases, again, domestic violence popped up so many times at those late night arrests. And I realized that I, I didn't want to represent everybody. I wanted to be able to have some control over that. And, and public defender's office are a little bit political on who they, who they uh, represent, how they represent them and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, um, going to law school, you uh, 
you were a student who has lived this uh, prior to going to law school you've worked uh, you've served the country as in the air force you served as a police officer you've worked in private sector as the manager of waffle house so you've worked at the public defender's office so you're not a typical green student what was law school like for you having those accumulated years of experience as a person well i um I was one of the oldest students in, in my class. I think there was one other one that was a doctor that had gone back to school to get a law degree. Um, but I had a great time. I, as far as, as meeting people, getting to know people, again, I probably had the most contact with people from uh, at least a social economic uh, situation that I've never really worked with or, or had been a, really been around. So again, it was a, another chance to learn people, learn about who people are, how they act. Um, but, you know, I don't have a lot of fond memories of law school. <laughs> Honestly, I felt it was very punitive. And uh, I actually, I was working at the clerk's office. I took, first off, I was a bailiff in Cincinnati after, after while I was a paralegal. And getting my bachelor's degree, I was a bailiff for um, Judge Nadine Allen in, in, in um, uh, municipal court in Franklin County. And um, when I my first year of law school, I had the, my role was not replaced yet. So I was driving back and forth twice a week from Columbus down to Cincinnati to help prepare the docket. Eventually, I was able to get out of that during my first year of law school, but I actually, by then I had gotten divorced and I had a child support obligation and I couldn't just not work. So I took a job at night with the clerk's office here in, in Franklin County and uh, I was doing that. And then eventually it was, that was sort of discovered by the, the law school and they said, yeah, you're not allowed to be working your first year. And I said, well, I I kind of took that. I thought that was more of a guideline and not a hard and fast rule. And I said, no, it's an absolutely hard and fast rule. So I had to leave that job and um, uh, I finished my first year of law school. And then again, I, I've constantly held a job. I've worked and, um, you know, it was it was an interesting practice going to law school, being that older person. You know, I think we were all old enough to drink. So I wasn't the guy they were asking to buy beer uh, back like I was back when I was in the um, in University of Cincinnati, you know, I was definitely with those those young kids. It was it was I was definitely the guy they were ready to say you're a lot like my dad. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, it was I, I had a different view on life, and a lot of times the professors asked, "Well, you were a police officer, you know, you're not you're not our typical student. What's your thoughts on this, and what's your thoughts on that?" And um, and I thought I, I honestly I thought, well, I was a police officer. Criminal just criminal law is going to be my easiest class. You know, actually, it was not. It was it was one of my toughest classes actually because we didn't deal with statutes, as you know, in in law school. We dealt with the model penal code, <laughs> which to me was it just was not necessarily in line with what codifications of, of our statutes are, whether whether it's Kentucky or Ohio or anything else. So, it was a, it was an interesting experience. I don't know it's something I would ever want to go back and do again, <laughs> but uh, it was um, it was definitely worth it uh, because, you know, I, I worked for the Board of Tax Appeals for a while. I worked at the prosecutor's office in, in Franklin County Municipal Court uh, negotiating and mediating bad checks uh, between vendors who took a check and the, and the check writer who was getting ready to be prosecuted criminally if the, we didn't work this out. So um, it, it was very interesting, uh, you know, working under Janet Jackson, who I believe she's still with United United Way, but she was the prosecutor at the time when I worked at that prosecutor's office while I was in law school. And I learned a lot from her and her staff. Um, so, I mean, again, life is, is such a learning experience for me that, that I look back at almost everything with fondness, uh, maybe not law school so much, but yeah. Did you uh, see a correlation or a connection between uh, being a cop and being a lawyer? Well, the, you know, initially I didn't think so. I, I I didn't. I saw that it was it was there was that connection, but I initially I saw that as so different 
that it was kind of like, you know, a nut and a bolt, you know, they're connected, but that neither one is like the other, but they, you know, you need them. Um, but especially when I, I left legal aid society and where it was a lot more teamwork, a lot more mechanics to it, but going into private practice and, and sort of handling things on my own from interviewing someone that walks through the door to representing them in their final hearings, I started to realize that my experience as a police officer really gave me insights about reading people, understanding people. And the unique thing about working in Covington, Covington, Kentucky as a police officer, there was a rural part of that that was farmland. There was suburbs that was, you know, your middle class suburban families. There was the east side with the uh, black urban population, the projects. There was the west side that was um, a lot of real solid Appalachian type, low income type of people. And then the northern part of Covington was a business, business district. On any given night, I'd be assigned to a different beat. And any given night, I could be dealing with someone that's a millionaire. I could deal with people that are small business owners. I could be working with someone that's that's you know got drug issues or someone that that's a parent of someone with drug issues. Uh, I could be dealing with with racial fights that that would would occur sometimes in those areas. Um, you know, in the in the projects, you had to learn to be able to talk to people on their level. You know, uh, you know sometimes you'd get up on this one area where you know anytime police go up there, the, all these buildings are on top of a hill. And bottles would just be lunged. I don't know where they got all these bottles, but there's always bottles. Uh, but they would be lunged out of windows at the police and the police cars. And you'd still have to get out there and do your job. And some, you know, a lot of times, especially domestic violence, you're not appreciated in being there often. Even though you're trying to take an abuser out of a household, there might be a child there in the corner with a black eye. There might be a woman there that's that's been pummeled. But they don't appreciate you leaving, especially if you're taking that spouse that that makes pays the rent. That they, you know, I literally was was hit with things by a spouse uh, after making an arrest for domestic violence. But one thing that I did come out of my experience as a police officer in those short three years was that I, I learned to read people, and I learned that you're not going to really be successful if you're talking to people on a higher level and they're down here. Likewise, you're not going to be able to, you know, the country boy, the not really country boy, but, you know, Kentucky as far as that's concerned. But, you know, I have a, a little bit of a plain speak way that I was. And in law school, they actually told us to try and get away from speaking in legalese, um, which I actually thought was that was probably one of the most beneficial things I learned in law school. But if you're down here and you're talking to someone up there, you have to be able to adjust your behavior, your expectations, and the way you you handle yourself in order to be accepted on a level that you can do your job. I think that's really important in representing clients. I think that will be really important in sitting on the bench because, you know, uh, I know from experience in representing clients, a lot of clients, you know, they walk into a courtroom and they see a judge sitting there up above them, you know, in that raised level. And they see that as they're powerful and they are, um, they're different. They'll never understand my situation. And to me, that's one of the biggest things that I can bring, I think, is that everyone that walks in that out of, walks into a courtroom, I think I, I have an ability to connect with them and I can read them. So I think that as far as a police officer and a lawyer con concerned, I think that at that part, your communication development is extremely important and extremely valuable as a lawyer. You have to meet people where they are. You have to Absolutely. communicate with people in the language they understand. I couldn't have said that better. Actually, you did a much better job than my long-winded <laughs> explanation. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's extremely true, whether I'm working with Latinos from the local community or the, the Somali population or 
you know, many of the other African nations, you know, I use Somali because I just, I worked so closely with that group and with uh, uh, the Chris uh, interpreters and stuff like that. But, you know, I worked with people from Ghana. I worked with people from Nigeria. I worked with, you know, Morocco and, you know, um, it, you know, you do have to absolutely meet people where they are. And then you um, end up working for Legal Aid. What yeah. was that like? That was never something that I thought I was going to be going to. Um, I didn't really understand what Legal Aid did. I just sort of saw them as um, more political things. You know, they fight for political change, which I'm not against that, but I thought I wanted to represent people. And, um, you know, I started actually, I left law school. You know, uh, we had just bought a house. I had a mortgage. I had didn't. I was too scared to put out my own shingle at that point. So I went to work at LexisNexis doing legal research, uh, and it got me a chance to to get comfortable doing that and start trying to pick and choose where I wanted to actually work. And um, somehow, it, I ran across the idea of a domestic violence attorney doing contract work, and it was through the Columbus Legal Aid Society. And I thought, wow, that's that's exactly what I'd love to do. And um, I didn't even know about civil protection orders at the time. Um, they were actually not that well known. And but I got into there. I met with um, with one of the uh, uh, staff there. Actually, uh, she's a magistrate now, um, Olga Bosk Milliken. And uh, I interviewed with her and and um, ended up getting the job. Um, I explained my passion was was to help domestic violence victims and to really do something more than arresting people, locking them up and them getting out of jail before I actually pulled out of the garage. <laughs> but so I felt like I really want to make a difference here. Uh, so I, I took on this job as a contract attorney doing domestic violence work. Uh, uh, Abigail and Les Wexner was part of the, um, the financiers of this grant to help domestic violence victims in a different way of just, you know, the band-aid of prosecuting those cases or even just getting them a protection order. It was a pro thing called Project Dignity. And uh, to this day, I think it's one of the most fantastic programs ever. Uh, but Karen Days, uh, she's a, a local person here that worked with the, the family coalition against family violence at the time. And um, uh we really, this team of lawyers went out there and not just got protection, not just helped them in ways of directing them where the local shelter is, although we did a lot of that. We did holistic services for these domestic violence victims because, as I said, you know, sometimes police officers weren't appreciated because, you know, they were, they were taking the breadwinner out of the household, so they'd be out on the streets soon. Uh, but domestic violence victims, they need so many services. They need housing. They need benefits. They need employment opportunities. We needed to try to work with that and, and figure out how we can not just solve this one little piece and put a Band-Aid on it, but holistically try and put this person in, in a spot that they can start to thrive again and not necessarily go back to an abuser uh, because they're, they're, they have no way of, of succeeding in life in their, in their view. So to me, that domestic violence project was extremely valuable. I, I moved on eventually from that, continued helping in family law, uh, but I became a supervisor at Legal Aid where one of my projects was prisoner reentry. Again, an area that a police officer is not necessarily inclined to, to want to help the guys getting out of prison until I really got into the role and started realizing how important it was to build with the local community, uh, you know, whether it's it's you know, the clergy out there, whether it's the local businesses for employment, whether it's the landlords uh, that, that to help these guys get places because recidivism, I think, really occurred more out of failure to thrive and failure to get back into things. And if they didn't have these resources available, then I think it was just, it, it's so difficult to get back out into the world. I mean, especially someone's been out in incarcerated for a period of time that they get that institutional institutionalism uh, feel that they they can't uh, sort of connect with the public anymore the, of being out there. And um, 
I, we were very successful with that. Uh, the team that we that I put together with the um, reentry program, prisoner reentry program, we actually got the Ohio Department of Corrections Gold Star Award, and they rarely give that to anyone that's outside of the Department of Corrections. For a private organization to actually get that was actually a pretty big deal, and we did that. We partnered with many people, and I think we helped a lot of people. That's awesome. That was wonderful helping a lot of people. And I noticed this passion for advocacy for domestic violence victims. This passion, where did that come from? Did you grow up around domestic violence? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I, I, I did, yes. I mean, there was some of that in my household. Um, you know, my mom was uh, involved in several relationships as a kid, you know, and, uh, you know, for a young kid, I was, you know, see, just seeing a stepdad out there and I didn't really understand until I really started learning about domestic violence of, of the situations that were occurring. And, uh, but I also, you know, at the same time, my mom was a tough cookie. So, you know, she was not necessarily not, uh, you know, completely innocent. I remember some fights that she'd gotten into and, and, you know, so I saw that, but it, I don't know that that really spurred me until I was a police officer and I saw how being a police officer initially, I thought I was the hero. I thought I was the guy that's helping people. And then I saw how it doesn't really fix things, arresting people all the time or, or taking them out of the house. It might put a Band-Aid or a temporary fix, but often domestic violence victims go back to their abusers, even if they do somehow are separated, whether it's by arrest or by leaving, going into a shelter. Uh, understanding that victimization that, that they experience it's important to know that you got to be able to fix these people in a way that is different from what law enforcement can do on its own. It's different than what growing up and seeing domestic violence in your household that you, you think there's a quick answer. Why doesn't that person just leave or why don't we just move or why don't he just go to jail? You know, and then you become a police officer and you see jail is not really the answer. It's it's fixing the victim more than it is, you know, chasing the offender. And then working with legal aid, I saw that fixing the, that victim is a very complicated task. It's not something that that is just, you know, throw some money to the lawyer. They do their lawyer thing and this person will be fine. It's it's a lot more in depth. I actually. We, one of the things that I did as, as a uh, member of Legal Aid is the team, especially Project Dignity, we went out across the country and we spoke at uh, National Legal Aid and Defenders Association conferences. Our, our program was considered one of the best in the country. Uh, we, we went and helped consult with uh, uh, San Diego in their, their um, uh, domestic violence unit that they built a very holistic situation that was it's fantastic. I mean, it's got the religious aspect. It's got the, the medical providers. It's got daycare for women that have children. It's got housing all in this one large building. Um, so it was really a fantastic <laughs> opportunity. But back to your, your question is, you know, yeah, I, I, I've seen domestic violence from almost every possible way that you can think of. And I think it's all part of, of who I am and how my passion for helping those people. Thank you. So you became the help that you couldn't render to your mom as a child. So as an adult, you are able to help other people as a domestic violence advocate. Well, I don't know. Maybe I, I need to pay you a therapy fee because <laughs> you just picked me apart a little bit. <laughs> Maybe I think I think there is. I think there is. Um, I like to think that more of it was because of my professional trainings. Um, and things like that. But yeah, I mean, you know, as, as a kid, I, I saw a lot. And when I see kids, whether I was a police officer, I saw myself sometimes out of those in the eyes of those kids. Um, some of the cases I do, whether it's a divorce or it's a custody case or a civil protection or for domestic violence, it does sort of haunt me a little bit, I guess, 
seeing the kids come in, you know, with their, with the parent and knowing I can see, I can see the, the thing that I experienced in their eyes. Yeah. The empathy. So now you're running for judge. Yes, absolutely. Tell us about the court and why you're running for that office. Well, I think this is the right time right now for me. Um, I've not really had a big inclination to run for judge. I've actually, I've, it was asked of me a few times and I quickly said, no, that this is not for me. I enjoy litigating cases and I probably have a reputation of being very um, aggressive and intent uh, on, on helping my clients you know, working with my clients. So I'm kind of, a lot of times I'm that guy that I want to be in the trenches. I want to be in that courtroom and arguing and, and doing my thing in there. Uh, so initially it's never really been a goal for me to become a judge, but I see after doing many cases for 20 years, I see that, that there's areas that I think we could, we can improve on. I think that we can do better. Um, I, I, I like all the judges that are on the sixth floor where I'm, where I'm running right now. And I think they all have wonderful aspects. Um, and of course, as any attorney, if they don't go your way, obviously you think there's things they could, they could improve on. But um, I think right now, one of the things that I miss was the specialty dockets that I've seen in other courts. I've seen a municipal court, Veterans. I'm a veteran and I, I work closely with a lot of veteran organizations. I do a lot of community work with different groups, um, Down syndrome, um, autism, all these things I work, but I also do a lot with the veterans groups. And I see that they see the world often differently than most other people, including the judges on the benches. And I really appreciated the idea of veteran court in municipal court in Franklin County. And I think that we, it would take a little bit of work. It would take some tweaking, but I think we could actually implement some a veteran oriented courtroom for domestic and juvenile cases uh, because there are so many special differences in the veteran situation, whether you're actually engaged in current and active in the military or if you're disabled from military service, there's so many different ways of, of where veterans, it, you always have to try to, if you're advocating for a veteran, you have to really work hard to try and get the court to acknowledge. This is a little bit different than, than the other cases, okay? This veteran aspect is something that we have to pay attention to. So I really think that we could get going on some specialty dockets with the Veterans Court. I'd love to see, uh, I haven't seen drug court um, in the past couple of years. Uh, so I feel like the drug court situation has kind of gone to the wayside and I thought it was a very successful program. Uh, so I'd like to see specialty dockets in domestic and juvenile court that, that have the drug court aspect uh, revived. Uh, and then there's the mental health piece. And I can't stress this enough. I mean, drugs and mental health issues go hand in hand. And not necessarily one causes the other, but they are usually there's they are often found together. And I think a mental health court and a drug court are essential in domestic. And I think it's because there's that's they're both very important issues that we have to take into consideration. And I know that many attorneys that are guardian ad litems, that's that's one of the areas that they struggle with. That they have to really try and grasp on and in, in making a decision uh, in their reports of how a, a situation should work out in the best interest of the child, taking those things into consideration. Um, unfortunately, my life, again, trial by fire is, you know, um, my son, my oldest son, Willie, um, passed away about 15 months ago of a fentanyl overdose. And, uh, and you know, that it strikes home, it's tragic, but it's also, it brings to reality things that I knew back when I was a police officer, crack was the big thing, you know. Now it's, it's a lot of it's heroin and now it's fentanyl is laced in things. And now recently we're hearing Adderall is being late, fake Adderall is being sold laced with, with fentanyl. 
you know, so how does that fit into domestic and juvenile cases? It only takes you about five minutes working on the fifth floor to see that there are drugs and mental health issues rampant in many of these cases. The fifth floor for those that are listening might not know is that's where children's services have all of their cases and they, they deal with things there. And children's services is sort of that acute um, answer to problems that, that have risen to the point that, that police or neighbors or anyone else might find or school officials and they report that and children's services gets involved in these cases. A lot of times I work them myself, drugs are an issue. A lot of times mental health is an issue. I mentioned mental health because I've also, five months ago, my sister, who was struggling with mental health issues for the last several years, she took her life. She um, was struggling with sort of schizophrenia and some other issues that were going on in her life. And um, she shot herself in a barn of her ex-boyfriend. And, you know, those, those issues easily transfer over. They, they transfer over almost, you, you almost feel it's a, it's a knee-jerk reaction, um, that it's, it's so closely involved where passion runs deepest. And passion runs deepest in family situations. Whether it's a married couple or it's a baby mom and baby dad kind of fight, whether it's the kids, it's juveniles that are, that are trying to figure out where they fit in this world and they get into criminal behavior or drug behavior, or they're just, they're struggling because they've not been diagnosed with mental health conditions as teenagers. And that's really where they start to start to rise up. Having a, having a court that acknowledges that and having a court that can sit on the bench and can connect with people with those kind of experiences, I think is extremely important. Um, you know, when I was at Legal Aid, one of the things that that has haunted me in a way that's always made me want to really give my best effort for every client that walks in the door is I was um, coming into work, I was getting dropped off by my wife and my uh, younger, youngest son. And uh, we pulled up to Legal Aid on Gay Street, and um, there was a white sheet in the alley right there. And uh, as we saw, it was, it was a body covered up. And um, I'd gotten into work, and I said, what's going on out there? Well, I found out that a man who was struggling with dealing with his, his custody case, he didn't get the answer that he wanted. And he had come to Legal Aid seeking services and he didn't qualify for those services. And in his mind, the answer to deal with that was to climb on or go up to the top floor of that parking garage and he jumped off. And to me, I don't want someone feeling that they can't get services to at least, even if they don't win their case, at least they understand their case. And, you know, I'm not trying to say I win every case. I would never say something like that, but you know, I want to work hard for them, but I also want to make sure that someone is explaining what the situation is so that they they don't feel that's the only answer. So that's much probably a much longer answer than you needed for, for that area, but. Uh, it's, it's okay. And I have an experience uh, losing a, a child to addiction and a sister to mental health. How does that affect you as a person, as an advocate, and as a candidate for judge? Well, I think that, you know, as a police officer, I saw a lot of nasty things. Uh, I saw a lot of death. When it's your own son, you look a lot closer at it. You know, you question why, what can you make different? Um, and fortunately, I think the questions that I would ask myself are right there in front of me and what I do every day. So I didn't feel the loss of not understanding things like a lot of other people did. I think I understood a lot what was going on. I just, it, 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 it invigorates a need to fix it in my mind. And that's what's led me to deciding for the first time ever that maybe 
I should be a judge. Maybe I should be up there. Um, not really because I don't think the attorneys that would be in front of me wouldn't be doing a great job doing, you know, trying to represent their clients, but a judge has that ability. And I've seen some really great judges and some that I don't think are that great, but I remember um, doing some municipal court work and I saw there was a judge that was there and she had a way of putting people in jail, but they actually they thanked her before they walked away from the table. I don't know how that magic happens, but she said, you know what, you're going to be okay. And we're going to get this issue taken care of. And you're going to go to jail for, you know, 30 days or whatever. And, uh, but you're going to come out better for it. And you're going to, and this is going to help you. And you're, it's going to keep you from repeating this kind of thing. Whatever her, her storyline was for that, for any of those cases. And I'd been in front of her a few times on some cases, but I thought it was just incredible how she had an ability to make people feel okay about going to jail. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's, it's also, it's wonderful because sometimes that's what you got to do as a domestic court and juvenile court judge, sometimes you're going to say the things that they don't want to hear. You're going to say, I'm sorry, but you, I'm not going to entrust you with your kids right now. Or I'm, you know, yes, I think that you might be doing a great job raising these kids, but this other parent has an equal right to do, give it a shot too. Um, and I think that my ability to communicate that, especially in light of a son passing away with drugs, because drugs, again, is, are in far too many of our domestic and family law cases than we would ever want. But it is a reality. But it's a reality that we need to, to influence people to get better, to fix the, the problem. And I think a judge is best suited to do that. Thank you. What do you want people to remember about you when they go to the polls? When they go to the polls, I want them to remember that, yeah, he's, he sounds like a pretty good lawyer. Maybe he'll make a good judge, but he can scatter, smother, cover hash browns like nobody else's business. So they want to see they want to see a judge that can cook hash browns like the Waffle House way. That would be me. Now, seriously, I think that that the thing that that they need to know about me that I hope that they go to the polls looking for is he's got a level of experience and qualifications that we're not likely to see in a whole lot of people. Again, there are a lot of good judges out there, but I think I've got, fortunately or unfortunately, as my life has spun out in this direction, it's, it's given me a window into the lives of a lot of the people that's going to come before me in ways that I can connect with those people. And I think that I would do a very good job. I hope that they can see that my experience is so unique so different from what your average politician or average judge might have is that this is what we want to see. We want to see this kind of person on our bench. Thank you. And what does it mean to you to come on this show, Legal Angle? Well, it means a lot, first off, because I, if you recall, you and I worked on a case long ago. Uh, well, not that long ago, a few years ago. So I, I, I've, watched you. I've actually read a little bit of your book. I can't say I've read through the whole thing because law school has sort of uh, uh, cursed me with the inability to completely finish books after being tortured with reading all night long every day. But uh, this is a good opportunity uh, for your viewers to hear me, to hear, get an opportunity to hear me speak. Uh, and it's it's from a, such a diverse background. I mean, I've I've watched your shows. I've watched other shows on 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 the Apex Radio, and um, I think that it, it's just it gives one more opportunity for people to actually get to know who they're they're voting for. And I think that's a rare opportunity. So I very much appreciate it. Thank you. And how can people reach you? People can reach me under, uh, they could go to my website at donrobertsforjudge.com. And it's just like that, donrobertsforjudge.com. Um, I have a Facebook page, the same thing, Don Roberts for Judge. So they can see me on Facebook. They can um, catch up with me. I, As I might have said earlier, um, I'm actually 
you can see behind me, there's a large amount of alcohol because I'm, ex I'm actually setting up a uh, bourbon and cigar event as a fundraiser, and that'll give me another opportunity to talk. Um, May 21st, I'll be speaking in Hilliard at the 10 Pen Alley. And uh, hopefully if people are curious about me, I probably talk as you've just learned in this interview more than probably uh, the average person wants to, to reveal about themselves, but I am very open and I like sharing. I like sharing my life experiences, good or bad. And I like um, giving the person an opportunity to get to know me before they vote for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. It's been wonderful talking to you for the past hour. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening to us, thank you for joining us and for giving us your time. Until next time, stay safe. Bye for now.